And welcome to the Inner Circle Boardroom's Backstage Pass. If this is your very first time here, a very special and warm welcome to you. My name is Kay Chohan. This is the platform you'll find me in conversation with investors, founders, and boards. I'll be unpacking their views on the global economy, shifting operating models, and the latest investing strategies. I'll also bring you the latest thinking into the market gaps, as well as some of the opportunities. I'm delighted today to introduce our guest today, who is Andrew Roman. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's an advisor, um, a three times author who is no stranger to the camera, has his own podcast as well called Fireside with a VC, which I highly recommend. He's raised over 48 million for a startup, which he found when he was only 28 years old. Today, he's the partner for a business by the name of 7BC Venture Capital, who focus on investing in AI, software, tech startups. Delighted to have you here today, Andrew. Thank you very much for joining us. In case I've missed anything off, is there anything else that you'd love to tell our audience? Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, no, I would just say that uh, we're an early stage venture capital investor investing in most of the tech topics that you talked about, uh, primarily enterprise software, but some rapidly revenue growth, profitable unit economic consumer internet deals. We, uh, we've made a lot of money in those in the past. And so when we keep getting the good ones, we do it. Geographically, Silicon Valley is home. Um, New York City is kind of our number, number two market. And London is, is a big market for us too. I actually lived in the UK for 10 years and I took an oath to the queen and her heirs in Kensington Town Hall. And I have a British passport to go with my American one. Delighted to have you here. There's so many things that I think we could be talking about. So um, let's just crack on. I'm conscious of time and I want to um, grab every opportunity I can to have conversations with you. So let's start with impact. Um, what impact would a global pandemic uh, have on some of your investment portfolios, particularly some of those startups and those mature businesses within your um, portfolios? Sure. So I would say that in April, um, we experienced the first real lockdowns in the United States and Europe. And we have, you know, businesses in London and Europe as well. And it was pretty bad. So the level of uncertainty appeared kind of, there was no idea when the uncertainty would end. And it was just bad. Then by the summer, people kind of realized, hey, I see these Amazon trucks coming in front of my house nonstop. E-commerce went from like 20% to 40% of, you know, the market. And most of our portfolio companies were benefiting. So we had a couple portfolio companies that, you know, one was like a hotel that was halfway between Airbnb and like Soho House or something. And they, they actually went under. So we lost a company. We had another one that was really focused on restaurants. Um, they're like digitizing everything in restaurants and supplying all the food trucks all over. And their trucks were all over San Francisco Bay Area. And then that came to a halt, but then they pivoted to delivering your groceries to your door if you're really worried about the pandemic. Um, so there were some rough, bumpy rides, but I think by June, we could see everyone is having a banner year that revenues from 2018 to 2019 to 2020 will still be, you know, 40% up, if not 7x up. Um, and so I think COVID has accelerated the world's adoption of a venture capitalist point of view of why should I go into my car to buy a Hoover? That's ridiculous. You know, just buy that online and have them deliver it. Um, so, and, and then I need to digitize everything. Um, so net, net it's benefited. And I would say that um, the venture capital market right now is if anything, a little bit frothy right now, you know, companies are raising that don't need to raise just because the market is hot. You didn't see that before COVID. That brings a lot of complexity when you're looking at things like valuations as well, and particularly tech firms. I mean, they're hot at the moment. I know some investors are actually stepping out of the US because they're looking at merging markets just because how hot the market is in, in the US. What sort of things are you seeing in terms of valuations? And obviously, you know, no doubt, I'm sure you're looking to invest as well. I mean, does it put you off or does it, do you still have that appetite or are you looking elsewhere? 
I think that um, it's not that challenging to invest in a company right now at a valuation that's higher than it should be, where you've just got conviction it's going to grow into that valuation. Um, that sometimes people are negotiating a senior liquidation preference that company has raised a lot of money up until now, and then they're going to come in at a stupid high valuation, but negotiate that when the exit comes, they get their money out first ahead yeah. of all the other guys. And considering what the lowest exit could look like, that looks like a near zero risk investment. So you see some of that on the high end of the market. I think that the kind of pre-IPO growth market where you see valuations north of a billion is pretty spicy right now. For us, we're able to dig into our own portfolio where we've known the companies for many years and we, we have a true understanding, at least we believe we do, with a lot of comfort about what a definitive exit looks like, what, what additional dilution would happen between our investment now and a final exit, or would we invest again, that um, we still see a lot of 10x to 50x opportunities on each single investment. Um, so I think it's easy to invest at too high a valuation right now, but the really sophisticated entrepreneurs are careful to not just go for the highest valuation, but to close around with the investors that can support them and help them. And even if they're not looking for much support because the company is killing it and crushing it right now, they wanna price this pre-money valuation with the size of the round. So 4X that post-money valuation could get in way on an M&A. So for example, take a company, we had a company, I won't say their name, that had offers to raise um, 10 million on a 90 million pre. So we would have had a hundred million post at post money valuation. And so that means if they get acquired, most of VCs are gonna wanna not be satisfied with anything short of a 4X valuation. So you'd have to sell the company for 400 million. Instead, we raised 10 on 40 with a post of 50, thinking we can easily sell this for 200. And the constellation of would-be buyers was just so much bigger. So as soon as you raise money at too high a valuation, you're going to start shutting doors and windows of opportunity of who could buy the business. you know. And so the really sophisticated ones are not going to raise at too high a dumb valuation. Where are you seeing investor appetite? Well, in my world, you've got the limited partner investors, you've got the venture capital investors, you've got the institutional seed fund investors, and then you've got the angel investors that are largely doing seed. Um, I would say that the seed market did not take a hit as much as it did in 01 and 08, economic downturns. What we tended to see there was if there's a continuum of investing in very early stage pre-revenue mm. up to last money before an IPO and secondary, like last money into Facebook and Uber, that when 01 came with the dot-com meltdown in 08 with kind of the mortgage-backed securities crash, you had um, a lot of people said, we want to invest in companies that are more mature, that have revenue. And, and so your early stage, we're getting cut off from the food supply. This time around, that didn't happen because it was a different kind of economic downturn where the government forced everything shut. But you also had um, seed funds that had raised money saying, our plan is to invest in pre-revenue companies and do three a week. So we're going to have 300 companies in here within a year and two and a half years. So that diversification neutralizes the risk. They kept investing, you know, pretty much throughout. I think you even saw April, and this is consistent with past downturns, when all of a sudden, like, uh, the storm shows up, everyone looks at their portfolio and says, okay, I want to give everyone a full 24 month runway. So these are loss making companies that are growing fast. If they're burning 200K, 500K a month, I want to tank it up. I want to put more petrol in each one of them so they can drive across this desert and come out two years from now when the market is recovered. So there was a, some panic investing where investors increase their ownership and much of their portfolio where the founder might've said, hey, I'm gonna sail close to the wind until I'm down to just six months of runway in the, in the tank, and then I'll raise for another 18 or 24 months. So there was a bit that happened right away. 
And then people kind of calmed down by June and kept investing. And it became clear which companies were COVID winners, which one were COVID victims. Just want to talk about those types of businesses that are raising, but not necessarily profitable, but are getting some silly valuations. Um, What's your perspective on that? People from outside of kind of the Silicon Valley inner circle, which includes pockets of Berlin and Paris that are also kind of part of a global Silicon Valley, but people that are outside of those different bubbles will look at Instagram being acquired for $1 billion from uh, Facebook and say, what? They have no revenues. They've been around for six months. That is Silicon Valley nonsense. And they're pounding their fist on the table with conviction about how foolish it was for Instagram to have happened. And they're just missing what's happening. At the time, Facebook had a hundred billion valuation. And so 1 billion was 1% of the whole thing. You know, if like I wake up in the morning in bed and my wife is like going through Facebook photos on her phone. And if that went over to Twitter, she'd wake up looking at Twitter on her phone. You know, if social photos left Facebook and went there. So I think Zuckerberg was very smart to buy a company for just 1% of his market share to stop photos from going anywhere but Facebook, right? And he successfully did that. And now Instagram is like Insta, it's a huge thing. And so if you look at that on a discounted cash flow basis of what's the top line revenue, what's the bottom line net income, and what's the growth as your model, then you should not be given custody of any money to invest in technology companies because you don't understand what is happening, right? You know, that that Instagram was feared by Facebook, courted by Twitter, and desired from VCs. So you had all of it mixing in the same 30-minute travel zone. And so you got to a billion-dollar pre-revenue exit that made total sense. And what is the enterprise value of it now? I don't know, but it's huge. And it looks like a 200x winner. You're very close to technology investing and the valuations behind that. How do you simplify it for somebody who doesn't actually get it? So we can talk about portfolio construction and where there is risk and not risk compared to other asset classes. And then we could talk about this water shift once in a gen- generation technology thing that is happening that's gonna change almost every company in the world, whether you're Intel with semiconductors or whether you're Campbell's soup, okay? So on the portfolio construction, if you're investing early stage, like pre-revenue companies, you probably should achieve a level of diversification that neutralizes the risk of any singular investment. If you're investing in early stage tech companies, you should expect that many of them are going to run out of money and investors will stop funding it and no one's going to buy it, or it gets acquired and you made like 1x back, which which is a wasted investment, or you get pennies on the dollar. You're lucky to get a third or 50% or 80% of your money back. Um, Once you achieve uh, a diversified pool of say 25, if you're doing a good job and you're well-connected and you've been around for a few decades, I think it's very hard to lose money there. I think that, you know, eight of them might drop dead. I mean, if 10 out of 25 are dropping dead, there's something wrong. But even if that happened, four would return all that money. So four of them would return all that money. You wait a number of years and one would return all that money twice. And you're probably making a 10x return on this as long as you are disciplined on portfolio construction. Now to do a single shot of say 1 million into 25 deals, and have nothing for follow on is pretty dumb. And so I think that the first way you make venture capital less risky than the stock market or real estate is diversification. The second one is double down on your winners. Imagine that we had a horse race and we have 25 horses. The starting gun goes off and they all start running. And one of them is clearly in the lead. And there's another four that are well ahead of the pack let's call that revenue growth. And you can see these have profitable unit economics. It could be profitable or it can keep raising funding for growth and wait for when they tip into profitability. 
And so if you have your top five horses, you could say, I'm going to use a third of my money to establish a position in 25. And I'm going to go never more than 10% in. Imagine 10% of your fund, call that all chips in at like the poker table. So you're putting a 10% bet on your number one horse. That's almost just revenue driven. And then 10% on number two, number three. So now 50% is still diversified by five. And you're highly concentrated in those. So when they become Facebook and Uber, it'll have a big impact on the performance of the fund. The other maybe 30% of your money is so well diversified over these 25 that this, I swear to you, is less risky than investing in the S&P 500. Um, that's just the way that it plays out with four or five going dead and get back 20 cents, 80 cents in the dollar, and then a bunch return the whole fund. And when you get 50 cents on the dollar back, the fund's already profitable. People are just happy to be getting more profit, even though you're getting half back as something dragged on for many years. So that's my basic idea on portfolio construction. On trying to speak about tech in layman's terms, I think that we've seen the internet come along and any anybody should recognize that's a big thing. You just look at the wealth of Jeff Bezos and, you know, Betfair in the UK and Zuckerberg, it's clear. If you look, if you look at the stock market in the United States of what were the largest five companies on the New York Stock Exchange 20 years ago, you saw Exxon as one and Mobile was another. Those two have merged. There was like oil and gas, JP Morgan Banks, Chase Manhattan. Then you fast forward a few years, Microsoft is elbowed in there but you still have ExxonMobil have merged. And then you go up and it's like literally Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, you know, Amazon, it's all tech and it's all West Coast United States tech. So all five, got rid of all the banks, got rid of all the oil and gas and it's all West Coast tech. And they wanna buy M&A everything like Instagram. You know, so to not pay attention to tech because you did so well in real estate, I think it's foolish. And I think that if you're a big pool allocator, you should take a view of investing and say, I'm gonna put 15% into early stage VC. I'll put this much into commercial residential real estate, fixed income bonds, emerging markets, publicly traded equities, US publicly traded equities. In, in that pizza pie, there should be some venture capital. And you should make sure that you're diversified enough for early or you're diversified enough for late, which can be fewer. If they're all EBITDA positive, you could get away with eight. I think it's dangerous to go below eight. I like having at least 25 and then double down you know, on winners along the way. On tech, the internet's a big deal, but we're seeing the automation of human workflows and we're seeing uh, tying together data that has conventionally been stuck in a tin silo. So if you're a credit card company, you have all this information about people, but you're not using it, you're not gonna be a credit card company in a couple of years because the other one who's using this data is gonna eat your lunch. So you know, the idea of taking 90 days to get a refi on your mortgage, that's gotta stop. It should be able to tap into some data sets with your permission even almost without your permission and, 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 and software is making decisions. So it's automating the human workflow and it's learning every minute from itself. So machine learning and artificial intelligence are impacting every single industry. Our fund tends to look for the large industries where you know the low hanging fruit is still a big bag of money. So if we can save some money for Barclays Bank. If we could allow Barclays Bank to start doing business in Africa with no risk, you know, that's interesting. So if you can save a little money or increase revenue or help them into new markets, help them get into adjacent markets, there's a lot of opportunity there. And um, I think large corporations that are not paying attention to tech, you know, are going to fall behind or go bankrupt. And large corporations that have a smart strategy of how to access external innovation and bring it inside are gonna be the big winners. And you're gonna see companies you never heard of become the next Barclays Bank, Toronto, you know, Toronto Dominion Bank, 
that we think some of the companies we're backing are going to be huge. And some of them are just going to get bought by Microsoft. Talking about some of that diversification and understand when you're looking at businesses, what sort of checklist do you go through yourself to, to see that this is an investable company? I mean, what is it for you that you need to be able to see that gives you confidence to allocate some of the uh, funds and cash that you have? So in real estate, you hear people say location, 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 location. I think in tech venture capital, I say management, 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 market, technology. So life has taught me if you really have a bad feeling about the CEO and the co-founder, um, maybe you shouldn't be partnering with that company as their VC. Um, you know, maybe I would have loved Steve Jobs being barefoot and weird hair and not showering, but, and miss that one. Or maybe I would have met him and said, this guy is mind blowing and uh, so viciously committed to making this a success that I would have gone in with him, you know? But I generally think the reason Apple became Apple was a little more to do with Jobs and Wozniak, you know? And so it really comes down to management and life has taught me that some founders are such good managers that when they're crashing and burning, they can still turn it around. And now that we've figured out it's worthless, they sell it for 400 million. You know, like they just somehow know how to be versatile and flexible. So I think management is number one. And there should be some kind of chemistry fit with early investors that are going to be involved or taking board seats and the management. So you can kind of be junior co-founder team supporting them. Um, it's got to be a big market. So the, basically we have losers. We're going to lose money on some of our investments. And so the other ones cannot be just a small 2x or 3x hit, they need to have potential to be a 55x hit to really make up for the ones that fail, that fail to perform. So might be a good business for someone to own a chain of restaurants in London or be the angel investor behind that, but it's not going to make up for us losing on other ones. So um, the market that they're addressing needs to be big. And then we generally do not invest in companies that don't have some kind of proprietary technology that nobody else has or gives them like a six month lead in a really crazy you know, arms race. So you want to back the company that's got conventional weapons and nukes, not the ones with just, you know, I can buy the same gun as anybody else. You want special weapons kind of thing. If you're a business and you're driving a big ship at the moment, how do you pivot? I mean, what, what, what advice do you have for somebody who's looking at becoming more tech enabled? What sort of conversations would you be having? So I've written a book on this topic, so I, I could talk for hours, but in brief, let me first say that it made sense for Intel to have Intel capital because they had Moore's law where the chip has to get, you know, twice as fast every 18 months and, make you buy a new laptop and all that and, and handle the software for the upward spiral of Microsoft is 10 times heavier OS in office as apps. Uh, but now, and, and it made sense for Microsoft to have a venture capital business because they're in the tech business. Now it's everybody. Like Bank of America Merrill Lynch is the largest IT employer in the world. That is an IT company, although their revenue streams are from financial services. You know, Campbell's soup is poisoning people with bad food that should be illegal and they should be moving towards plant-based, you know, food that's got a little protein in it or it's healthier for you and we can live longer, happier. Literally every business is a tech business. So don't think just because you're not Intel with Moore's Law, you can sit this one out. I think it's literally everybody. Government should be, healthcare should be, education should be. So it's really everything is now impacted by these changes that we're seeing. What I recommend in my book, and you can get chapter one for free. Um, I could maybe post it in the show notes, but I basically say I interviewed over 400 corporate venture capital executives, which is just kind of what I do. I meet with other VCs. So it wasn't, I just would like write it down on these guys. And I say, why do you do this? What is the primary reason you're doing this? And some are saying it's all defense because our business is going down. 
were number one in wireless modulators were Ericsson. Ericsson has to get in the data center to sell stuff because no one needs another mobile phone network in Vietnam at this point. So they have to diversify their revenue streams or they're going to die, you know? And so they've created Ericsson Venture Partners, a business unit to invest in startups. Albert Kim lives in Palo Alto and they're getting into deals with us. And so they can see the future that's pitching us for funding today. And we've gotten them into a bunch of data center related tech deals that they then acquire via M&A. And now they're successfully diversifying, diversifying from the mobile phone network to the YouTube, Facebook, hyper data center. You know, who's gonna host TikTok? You know, they wanna sell that stuff, you know? So basically I think that in any large corporation should have a strategy to access external startup innovation. And it's not about paying 25 million a year to McKinsey to write reports for you to read. It's about literally seeing the startups. And so the way to get into that overnight is to have a fund of fund program. So the large corporate should, in, like Cisco, I talk about this in my book, you know, Frederick Rambeau went to Europe for Cisco they had half the revenue from Europe and no employees in Cisco. So they told them start buying companies so we can have employees over here for tax and just being good stakeholders. He invested in 54 VC funds across Europe in one year and then started cherry picking the best deals out of their portfolios that were strategic for some business unit inside of Cisco. So Cisco, wasn't going to take a single risky chance on missing out on any tech happening in Europe. They just had a bucket of money. They funded all these VC funds as opposed to repatriating it to dollars and getting taxed coming and going. And they're going to make money. The punchline is they're going to actually make money as an LP investing in those 54 funds. And then, you know, Frederick can like wake up at 10 a.m. and go to bed at 4.59 p.m., knowing that those VCs will show him any deals that tick his five exciting boxes. And then he can then directly invest in them. Now he's got information rights and he can M&A buy them and it, it achieved an objective. So I say, don't try and catch up with my 30 years of relationships, you know, buy your way in. It's like bribing an American Senator. You can legally do it, unfortunately and they will start doing what you tell them to do. I think that's a horrible situation. With venture capitalists, you can invest in a VC fund and say, I wanna see all healthcare IT, or I wanna see all this, and they'll show it to you. And you can jump into that overnight and you know, survive this tech sh shift. If it's as simple as that, why do more companies not do it? My book is not selling enough copies. No, I, I, I don't know. I think that, I think you're seeing most large corporations have some kind of corporate venture capital business unit that's investing directly, or they, they're an LP in one fund somewhere, or they're in an LP in a couple funds. But I think that uh, what I'm learning as I get older is that everything is changing and everything is evolving. And it's not just like, this is how it is. Definitely not in our world. So I think we're in a state of evolution. And as a strategy person, I think, it makes sense to say in my chapter one, I even start bullet pointing. What bullet pointing? What are the reasons you operate a CBC? Like if you're Time Magazine, you have 74 print publications, you're going to go bankrupt. You're going to go bankrupt if you don't change your business. Whereas some conglomerate out of Jakarta, Indonesia, they were like, we had 500 million of EBITDA and now we have 2 billion. What do we do with $2 billion? Pay a dividend? or get more conglomerate and get into more businesses. So everyone's unique. So I say, read through those lists of these are the reasons other people to drive M&A or to diversify into more AI engineers and data scientists that work there, whatever your, your purpose is, circle the ones that work for you and then agree, this is our constitution. This is what we're trying to achieve. What's the best way to get there like tonight? And then identify VC funds that operate in these geographies and sectors and at that stage of, you know, from early to late continuum, and then see if you can get connected to them and see if they're willing to take money 
And then I say, see if they're willing to work with you. Like see if they're willing to share information, let you come and sit in their office for three months or six months or one week so that you actually see the information. Just throwing 50 million for a hundred billion dollar company, you know, throwing 50 million and getting 500 million back actually does nothing for Verizon who has a hundred billion dollar market cap. But Verizon is still charging money for minutes, data and roaming, which is ridiculous. They're the mobile internet in your pocket and they still have not figured out how to make money on anything but this dumbness. It should all be free. And all you have to do is book a hotel twice a year. You know, book a suite at the Savoy and boom, free phone for five years. What does, what does change mean and look like for an investor and board post COVID? And how do you think investment strategies and priorities will change as a result of the pandemic? Well, I think in Silicon Valley, we're seeing a lot of human migration. So it, it, it was extremely important for my father to have an office in Midtown Manhattan when he was a lawyer and just couldn't conceive of having his business anywhere but there. And it's sort of the same for New York VCs, London VCs, Silicon Valley VCs, even whoever the king of LA is. Um, I think now you kind of have Jack Dorsey saying you can work from home forever. Maybe if you travel a lot, that's possible, you know, but I think that's a big shift. So like New York has always been my second largest network and they're almost all in Florida right now or the Hamptons, kind of in these two different places. Then some are just randomly everywhere. But the key thing is that the New York network is still there. It's still real. It's still active. They're still funding. They still call themselves a New York fund, but I don't think any of them want to go home and pay that tax again after zero state income tax, you know, in Florida. But I think change maybe is uh, more of the general population of the US and Europe and Asia and, and everywhere has woken up to the kind of digital stuff we were working on before. And even down to little things like contactless payments and just safer things and streamlining that. Do I really have to stand in, in person for hours to get my driver license? that a lot of things are just getting get digitated on a, digitized on an accelerated pace. And, and um, I think COVID was hard with sales cycles if you can't you know, fly from Europe to the US or fly from the US to Europe to buy a company. They really wanna meet the team and kick the tires. But you know, vaccines are here and travel will be pretty open easily within a year from now. And I think that COVID will go down in history as the big digitization, you know, accelerant that we all got injected with the knowledge that th we're doing everything wrong and we should fix these things with software and more data-driven decisions. So I think that's maybe a big change. Do you see some of uh, the VCs and PEs and other funds changing their strategy. One of my portfolio companies, Dealflix, which failed, um, but I loved the founders. They were like living in a van, building their business. They're hilarious guys. He's now been to business school and he's got a search fund where like a search fund has said to him, here's some walking money, go find a business between this size and this size that we can acquire. And then we'll digitize the hell out of it and then we'll sell it, uh, we'll flip it now that it's you know optimized for tech. And I've heard of other PE funds that are looking to buy a, you know, a smaller portfolio of businesses that they can tool up with tech to improve and then and then and then sell them that way. I I find that a little boring you know, personally, and a little limiting on, because these businesses will ultimately be buying off the shelf technology. And what would the stock market, you know, or even the private markets value them as a multiple of revenue? You know, some of these things are like 0 0.8 times book, you know, and even if you're digitized, and so you're efficient, you know, you might look better on a discounted cash flow basis, uh, higher growth and higher net income to drive your model on your valuation. But just what multiple on sales, what multiple on EBITDA, 
if if there's no actual proprietary technology in there, I begin to lose interest. And I think by there's only so many hours you have in the day to look at investing or helping or supporting a company. If you're spending your hours on companies that actually have unique technology that should command multiples of minimum 10x, you know, forward-looking a you know annual revenue run rates like ARRs, then you know, you know, you work hard, you make introductions, you get them a customer, and that that whatever that customer brought in for revenue, we want to be you know 24x revenue. Um, so I just find it more interesting to support the companies that are selling. You know, it's kind of like the gold rush. I'd rather sell the jeans and Levi's and the the pickaxes and shovels than be banking the next jockey to buy shovels and axes and hack it out before they run out of gold. So everyone wants to become the next Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. I just want to talk a bit about branding and subscribers to, to new platforms. The cycle of installing software, we used to see where businesses would do um, lengthy contracts and also the cost of acquisition of customers and the loyalty and the behavior of customers especially nowadays when there's so much new tech coming about you know nobody really wants to be stuck with their software so to speak how do you see that whole ecosystem when you are looking to invest and you know you're looking at what the buying patterns are of consumers and, and enterprises you're talking about uh, cac to ltv on the consumer side and kind of cac to ltv TV on the enterprise side and how long you're trying to tie somebody in under under lock and key contract. How do you look at the longevity of the client and make that valuation when actually nowadays clients want more freedom and choice? So uh, if you're investing very early stage, you don't, you, you're going to have less historical information to show you how cyclical it is. To, does revenue for the gym spike up in January after the new year resolution and does it drop off, you know, here and spike up again in the summer when people want to fit into their beach body again you know so you can you can kind of attempt to predict you know a healthy smoothie drink it could probably even if you don't have the historical information you could probably predict when it goes up and down and then look at the data you have but in general you know there's cost of acquiring a customer that can be measured quite simply and so what is cac cost of acquiring the customer and what is the lifetime value of the customer. So CAC to LTV is generally how we think about a, a company being able to demonstrate that they have profitable unit economics or not profitable unit economics. And you know, you put 50K into advertising spend to acquire customers and you only get 25K of revenue. And so now you put like 5 million in and you get two and a half million of revenue. This is not good. You want to figure out how can we tip that so that you know we're getting positive unit, unit economics, at least on this part of the business, not to the mention that I pay these salaries for these expensive engineers in London or New York or Silicon Valley. So um, we, we look at that CAC to LTV to try and understand how the business is doing. And we look at the funding history of the company of what they achieved with however much funding they've raised to date and we try to understand how much money do you need to raise to be able to achieve a 24 month runway. So what our monthly spend will be, even if revenue were flat to be conservative, how many months, so what's the burn rate? If you're, if you're spending a million a month, or if, if you're spending a million a month and you got 500K of revenue, you are burning 500K a month. And so how many months do we have before you burn out? And so, these are ways we think about how much should you raise in this next round and how would we come to a sensible valuation for the business? If you raise that much, how much are you selling to investors and how do we justify uh, that valuation being the correct you, you know, you know, valuation? So that's a little bit how like the brain thinks. You asked about, you seem to be thinking that enterprises when buying enterprise software do not want to be locked in for multi-year contracts well it cuts both ways if if a startup is early in their proving out of just how valuable their software is you know like if they say we can deflect 
80% of your phone calls to the call center and it costs you 20 quid per call. So how much is that worth? And we can shorten the duration of your remaining 20 calls and we can increase customer satisfaction because our software just instantly fixes all their problems that that's going to lower churn. So you can start to get into like a discounted cash flow of like, hey, you think you have this many customers now and you project you're going to have this many with our software, we're going to save you a billion euros. I'm going to save you a billion euros. How much do you want to pay me for that? And if they say, oh, I only want to do one year because I don't want to be tied in. I'm like, that is great because I don't think you guys have as much faith and conviction as we do on us actually saving you a billion euros. So I'll give you this much now. And now you're on the drug dealer model. How much do you want to pay for your second hit for year two? And I'm happy to go 12 months with you. That's when they're like, we talked about this and we think we should lock in. How much revenue does the company have? And I'm like, I don't know. They're like, come on. And she's so like, all right, well, we would be half your revenue. We think that's a big deal for you. Let's lock in a five-year or three-year contract. So I've been on all sides of, you know, flexibility of no contract. And in general, if you don't have reoccurring revenue, the multiples are not as good. So some companies have the puppy dog model that pay for usage, pay for what you eat, come and go, run a campaign now, run no campaign during COVID, come back and run a campaign after COVID. I, I like companies that are confident enough that they can make the customer pay. And depending on the nature, if it's enterprise, the enterprise doesn't want the risk of, you know, either a, a price hike or we signed exclusivity for your sector with your competitor, you know? So where are you seeing some of the distressed opportunities that you think will recover? Guys looking for distressed opportunities. I kind of think of these people as bottom feeders. It's like, I'm sure you can make a lot of money killing people in a bank and stealing the money, but is that really how you choose to live your life? Like, is that what you want to do with your remaining days? And I guess for some people, it's a thrill to buy a distressed opportunity. But like, I think of people that were on the fence of putting money into our fund during COVID, they're like, well, if I just wait a few more weeks, I think I can buy property in Pebble Beach and Lake Tahoe really cheaply and then flip them a year later when these second homes started turning up in foreclosure or the first thing to go was the second home. Or I wanna buy a hotel out of distress that some guy's got a hotel in Greece offering it to me for 500K and he was trying to get it for 5 million just a few weeks ago. If I just wait a little longer, sharpen my knife, I can get it out of administration. It just kind of turns me off. Um, I, I just think that I, I, there's no question that's your strategy, you know, is to feed off the dead carcass of somebody else. But, you know, it kind of annoys me. So, so I think it's more a way of looking for a sleepy incumbent that has had a, there's like two sleepy incumbents in the UK and the, uh, uh, on the, you know, premier mortgage and the premier finance industry. And they're so dead on technology. And Bundeep, an old friend of mine said, I'm going to disrupt that with Premfina. And if we just apply a little tech and get a little market share, someone from outside will say, I want to challenge the two incumbents and stir it up by having acquired Premfina with the best SaaS tech for, you know, this, this uh, premium finance thing that I'd rather kind of look at not a distress, but like someone fell asleep at the wheel and they don't care yeah, because they're so I big that we can go send 30 engineers after that. And a couple of the same salespeople that did that last company together and they'll build Europe for this U S company and we'll do it again, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I don't like the idea of feeding off of anyone else's misery. Obviously, the hospitality business has been down a lot and the travel industry, although I think Airbnb had its best ever July in 2020 by revenue. I think that when in California, they really shut down all the schools. Yeah. And so my kids are doing distance learning, all the events stopped, all the face-to-face -face meetings stopped. 
So my wife had us in very interesting places, you know, with Airbnb being everywhere. And we were not the only ones doing it. In the month of July, 2020, their revenue was something like 40% up revenue of 2019, July. You know, uh, people were locked up. So you might as well be locked up somewhere with a pool or a view of the ocean or in the mountains or somewhere, you know, interesting. A lot more people were introduced to either being the host or being the, the traveler. So if you look at it from a CAC perspective, the CAC to LTV for the business is pretty good. And they IPO'd the company right at the end of the year at a pretty good time, and at least for the US market, which is their number one. But it's a global business, you know, you know, for sure. So tell me, what business models do you think will not survive and what will replace them? Yeah, you know, there's some people who really are kind of introverts that never like going to the office that think that commercial real estate's not going to bounce back. And I think that's very myopic. I think that um, you're going to have a lot of companies that choose to be in San Francisco and there's no working from home and everybody come here every day. And it's like the 300 from Sparta can destroy an entire Darius, the three army, even though there's fewer of them and working together is that. And other ones will find their culture like SurveyMonkey doesn't have to do a lot. And so they actually applied a lot of women returning to the workforce only working like four hours a day because the survey monkey kind of does its own thing. So that culture was beautiful for attracting the right people to survey monkey where some vicious young entrepreneur with no spouse or kids will require everyone spend all weekend at the hackathon, which is how Zuckerberg kept old people out of employment of Facebook. That if you get a job interview, you have to spend the whole weekend doing hackathons until they can figure out this guy has to see his family, no job offer, you know, that, that cultures will emerge and find, you know, you know, what works for them. But I think some people say that the commercial real estate will change. I think we might be more um, that you're going to have more pods. So instead of everyone coming in to like Canary Wharf or the Salesforce tower or the empire state building, it'll be that you come into the super city twice a month and you're working out of a regional pod for four days a week and you got used to Fridays working from home you know somewhere in there you know so I think there'll be more flexibility on it but that creates a huge opportunity you know on that side I think that the percentage of people that are top graduates from schools or even dropping out early that want to be entrepreneurs is increasing radically so like I'm getting older and when I was graduating from undergrad, people wanted to get a job working for Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, IBM, Accenture, big corporates, big consulting. Like I remember after the dot-com crash, my MBA buddies were saying, you know what B2B stands for? Back to banking. B2C means back to consulting, you know? And it was back. So, so it meant that everyone wanted to be in banking in consulting. In Japan, they want to work for the government, if you can believe it top grads in Japan, where when the internet came out in the late 90s, everyone wanted to be a dot-com millionaire. And then after the crash, it was back to banking and consulting. I think that overall, we're seeing a lot of young people don't want to do the work. They just want to be influencers. They want to have a YouTube channel. They want to um, be Mark Zuckerberg and don't realize how intense that person, Mark Zuckerberg is. And they're never going to be that. But Still, the number of people that are going to go and do their Bunsen burner science experiment is increasing. So to answer your question, what business models do I think will work and what will not work? I think every business model will be challenged. The percentage of people willing to challenge has increased a lot. And so you're going to see more experimentation. And one of the things that large corporations should be accessing is simply so yeah, everybody switched to the gig economy. Is that really true? We're going to have no more W-2 full-time employees and everyone will be a 1099 contractor. That for them to be connected to the venture capital ecosystem even allows for them to find out, okay, after two, three years, is that working? Is crowdfunding going to destroy the venture capital business or is it going to help? You know, like, um, so I think that volume of entrepreneurs attacking the fortresses will create more business models. Mm. And rather than say which one works and which one doesn't is, well, you gotta take a face-to-face -face meeting or a Zoom meeting and say, walk me through your CAC to LTV 
tell me the story. And maybe we have ideas of what you can do, what you can do differently. How do you think owners and operators should be thinking about their business moving forward? We all went through this very painful, difficult year that was wonderful for some people to be together with their family and kids and horrible for single people or old people that were really cut off and afraid of dying for good reason. Um, but things generally, you know, the, the, the ones that were too much a direct shot, like a hotel business, they went bust. Some went on to life support. Some founders were better of saying, hey, you know what? We actually have 50 million cash in the bank. I'm just going to fire everybody and put the company into holding pattern and then rehire anyone I can when the hotel and restaurant business is open again, you know? And, and there was a bunch that should have done that and didn't. Like they were just deer in the headlights. Do you think that's a good strategy? I think I'm more compassionate about people than most people in my business, but there's nothing noble about sinking the Titanic to the bottom of the, the North Sea with every man, woman, and child on it. That is nothing to be proud of. And there's a lot of all these entrepreneurs that said, we never fired anybody during COVID. And it's like, so how's the business doing now? You know, so I think you're, it's an obligation to figure out how to respond to a crisis and lower your expenses and, you know, negotiating lower salaries or terminating people or saying, look, maybe there's someone out there that can hire you. There's some businesses like, you know, Walmart, you know, increased their e-commerce by 70, 74% in the month of April. Maybe you can get a job working for Walmart labs. We are dead in the water and I need to cut your salary now. I know the person who runs Walmart labs in San Bruno. Like, you know, you don't have to, if, if you're a high quality person at a tech startup, finding a job shouldn't be your problem. You know, if they've shut down the coal mine, yeah, that's hard for that person to pivot into, you know, you know another opportunity. When you look at the amount of quantitative easing going on, and then you look at interest rates, bonds, LTVs, how do you make sense of what's going on and you know what's a zombie company considered how do you look at the world well i thought that the us the eurozone the uk and japan were would have done more qe to print more of their currency which they can uniquely do and put it in the hands of people to not get kicked out of their homes and turn violent you know but amazingly the economies were more resilient than anyone could have ever expected. I do see a lot of restaurants that are shuttered and closed, and I do see shuttered businesses, and my heart bleeds for them. But the 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 QE, the, the quantitative easing of the printing of money, just to throw it into kind of welfare things, um, doesn't seem to have dragged down the currencies as much as I predicted they would. I thought I was saying to people. Like, you know, I've got a LP from Zurich who said, you know, Andrew, I don't know if I want to re-up a lot right now into your fund because I really don't want to be exposed to the dollar and you have a dollarized fund. And so this was smart people talking about the effects of QE and even a Biden win. And, um, but I think that he's wrong. I think that if a company is sitting on a lot of cash, you've seen some companies put it into Bitcoin, which they say, if we can go long on it, Bitcoin is going to go up. It'll be volatile, but My it will strategy. go up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that where is the value? And like I was telling you about this fund of ours, our growth fund, where there's nine companies that were pre-negotiated. Every one of them have one thing in common. 2018 to 2019 to 2020 to 21 revenue like up 4X, up 7X, up 4X, up 5X, that companies that are growing their revenues like that, and you get a bundle of nine of them, that's where the value is. Somebody who offers something that is saving or increasing money, whereas a currency right now, keeping a lot of money in fiat currency or trying to look at bond yields is the last place I would put my money. But I've been wrong before, and all this QE did not seem to create any Armageddon. I also thought if they all do it, then the exchange rate among the primary reserve currencies, yen, euro, dollar, sterling, 
wouldn't be badly impacted. And I was scared about what would happen for the UK in a post-Brexit world. But they look smart because they've all got the vaccine. You could argue that because we're not in part of the euro, we've been able to get our own vaccine. We've seen the France and Germany, they're all a part of the EU and they've had to allocate a certain amount um, to each country. And, and, and one might argue that's the reason why. And Brexit has been, and the quantitative easing is really interesting as well, because to your point, do you really want to hold cash? But obviously interest rates are slowly creeping up. How much risk do you want to take as well? I just find it fascinating what the markets are doing at the moment and how you have to shift through that. I am conscious of time but what's your thoughts on blockchain technology you know a lot of people will attach blockchain technology to crypto and i'm talking about just the 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 technology piece do you see that as where investors like yourself will be looking next so my third book is called masters of blockchain where i interviewed some of the people who made ethereum and like the top actors and a bunch of crypto whales that became billionaires you know from it are worth hundreds and hundreds of millions I think there's, uh, it took me a while to invest the time to kind of school up and understand what what was going on there. And most people just don't have the time. Kind of like, you need a lot of time to play 18 holes of golf, you know? And in my life, it's hard to kind of create that time frequently. Um, so I think that people misunderstand what is blockchain. They don't understand distributed ledger technology. They don't understand programmatic software and smart contracts. And they get confused with crypto and crowdfunding for a scam that you have entrepreneurs that were criminals that or very bad entrepreneurs that would rush the unsophisticated public spread across the world globally like South Korea to invest in their startup promising that they could publicly trade the token, which is essentially the security on a crypto exchange. So who cares if this ever works? You'll be able to get all your money out before we find out if our engineers can even make a minimum viable product. So you have this kind of crowdfunding 1.0 kit, crowdfunding 2.0, um, and every single token is called a cryptocurrency. So someone could equate the term crypto with all of these tokens that raised a lot of money that went to zero and much just lined the pockets of the criminal founders or these very merchant day trader investors that were investing and selling within minutes of their pump and dump. Let's SMS the whole group that we're all going to buy it at noon and sell it at, you know, 2 PM. And that's all really unfortunate. So it's given a really bad, um, you know, a bad stain to the whole to the whole industry. When in reality, if you look at if they had put the US presidential election on blockchain, which I don't understand why they don't do that. Maybe the Republicans are trying to suppress the vote and suppress the brown vote. And so there's some very powerful forces that do not want to have a clean election. So they're actually openly pushing the corruption agenda. So, but, but the truth is, if you, it, w- it would take me a day to get an app that could go on everyone's phone and they could you know, vote and the entire ledger of votes would be on their phone to make it impossible for anyone to cook the books. If you think about like the dirty South of Rome accountant who's cooking the books and he's stealing money because he's the accountant or she's the accountant, You cannot do that if every time you vote, it goes to a thousand ledgers on every single phone, you know? So, you know, it's it's a timing thing. I thought QE would be worse. And I thought that um, the adoption of blockchain technology, smart contracts, all of this digitizing sovereign currencies would have happened faster. Yeah. I'm not that surprised about the pace. I, I, I predicted the Chinese would be the first and they are. Um, I guess there's arguably this like random sovereign currency in the middle of Federation of Micronesia or something like that. But um, the first real currency, or I shouldn't say it's a real currency uh, to try to do that. But I think there's advantages of if you just digitize the sovereign currency of say the UK and um, you invest a hundred thousand sterling into my fund, 
my my KYC know your customer and anti money laundering AML should be so tight. I should be able to trace where was that money before it was sent to you? Where was it before it was sent to that person down to the Genesis block of when it was created by the Bank of England? So you could just do so much with that, that it's, it's inevitable that you're going to digitize, you know, a currency. So somebody to say crypto, bad crowdfunding stock, that's two very different things. I was like yourself on that journey of understanding it. I agree with you. It could be used in all sorts of smart contracts and um, voting and from our health system all the way to supply chain. In terms of investment, whoever's making those blockchain chips that you can put into the, the credit cards. And I think MasterCard or Visa, they're starting to look at something like this now. I just think it's fascinating. The other thing that I wanted to speak to you about, I'm going to go a little bit back. I'm going to talk about subscription-based models, about food. When COVID happened, we saw people were ordering online. So they were using Uber Eats to, to now order their food. However, when I speak to certain entrepreneurs and they talk about the difference between having a, a retail uh, presence to using something like Uber Eats, which takes a very high percentage, um, and then the cost of actually setting up your own operation and delivering it. For instance, in the UK, we've got Asda um, or Sainsbury's or whoever it be, they do the home deliveries but then you've got things like carbon footprint which starts coming into it and the cost of actually acquiring the the vans to run these you need fridges in there you you know all that sort of when you look at that ecosystem it doesn't sometimes make sense from an economical standpoint from a PL. and i'd i'd be interested from a tech perspective what your view on that is so one of the companies we invested in is called daily harvest all woman founder company in New York City. And they started off making smoothies. So re really healthy smoothie smoothies. And they would flash freeze uh, the, the fruits and berries and stuff at the farm. And so apparently, you know, if you get like a strawberry and you're like, oh, it still looks good. And you're like, oh, that one looks terrible. Even the one that looks good has already lost 80% of its nutrients, even though it looks great. So if you actually freeze it, you think our frozen food dinners from the 1950s bad. You actually want to freeze all these blueberries and stuff right at the spot and they ship you on a subscription on dry ice, like a package of your daily harvest stuff, which even includes healthy ice cream and all this stuff. And, you know, you can order X number of them to come as frequently or infrequently as you want, but the revenues of this company just went nuts. So if you're thinking that people do not want to pay a subscription, some do. And, um, I was not really a smoothie person myself. In fact, when I went in to meet Rachel the first time, she was, can I get you a smoothie? I was like, no, do you have any sparkling water? Like, and then, and then I was in back-to-back -back meetings with my partner and, and then she's like, and then a minute into the deck, I was like, I should have gotten the smoothie, right? And she goes, yeah, you should have. But they, they like, I think it's in the public domain, they doubled revenue from 2019 to 2020 and they got bigger than $250 million in revenue for that year. And so if they were to get spacked, that would value the business at 2.5 billion. And I think we invested the first time at a 30 million pre. So it's an example of that one investment and we doubled down a bunch of times, just literally returns an entire fund, you know? So for someone to tell me people don't want to subscribe to a food subscription, I can't, you know, you know, Daily Harvest is a huge hit, blockbuster, stellar result. Um, do people really want to, subscribe to the uh, HelloFresh or Deliveroo, you know, stuff. I think we're seeing that people try the box to then cook at home with all the stuff in it. Um, and then they say, I've, I've had enough of that. So the CAC to LTV was bad. So the cost of acquiring the customer for the food box to cook in your own frying pan or whatever, um, seemed to have people trying a few different services and then go, you know what? I like the old Marks and Spencer's thing. I'll just go get the crispy aromatic duck from there. I don't need to do this HelloFresh. It's actually very expensive. That it's hard for them to put that in your box with sustainable, you know, packaging. And so I think that's tough. So it's all one, you have to look at everything as a one-off unique thing. Um, clearly, like I don't know, but I would expect 
um, Daily Harvest is going to be over 500 million in revenue pretty soon. One may argue, well, actually, they're going to do well if they were in 2019 and going into 2020 because like of it's all COVID, COVID lift. Yeah, it, it was an uplift through that. Now people now COVID has hopefully passed and gone people want to go back out and socialize and they don't want to be sitting at home yeah but you know what else people are gonna uh go on a vacation they're gonna go on a conference they're gonna eat at a big meal in mayfair or something and they're gonna go oh man i gotta get into my beach body and get back on the daily harvest you know uh another one of our huge performers in that food section is super coffee where it's like cold refrigerated coffee like the starbucks frappuccino stuff but they put monk fruit, which has no sugar. And so it could be as sweet as someone who wants to drink a red can of Coke. And then they put a little bit of protein powder in there. So you can just kind of have that and then get through your day and then go out for the big nasty dinner and order all the wrong things to treat yourself. So I think in a post COVID world, we're gonna be putting weight on and we're gonna still need to take it off I think that those companies have just established brands at this point. It's kind of like Stella Artois is not going to go bankrupt. Yeah, I don't want to reveal confidential information, but these companies have hundreds of millions of revenue yep. that grew very fast. They were huge COVID winners, but they were more than doubling revenue on the years leading up. So these were like your two, four, six X a year. And when you get big to like, are they going to go from 250 to more than 500 in 2021? We can't say and shouldn't be saying in this forum. But um, I think that some of these healthy, I get a little excited by food sometimes because like in Canada, if you eat like Cheerios or something, it's illegal to lace the Cheerios with some chemical that signals to the brain that you're hungry when you're not. In the United States, they lace the Cheerios with some drug, like it's Philip, hello, Philip Morris, to once you're full and the body signals that you're full, this thing tells you you're still hungry. I mean, at some point, you got to change your government for allowing that from some donation. So I, I think the whole food industry is very ripe for disruption. So rather than look for some distressed thing to invest in and flip or chainsaw up, I get excited about uh, doing something good and, and, and cleaning up something ridiculous, like uh, General Mills should clean up its act. Right, this is my last question. What is the misconception around VCs that you would like to clear up here? Uh, I guess when I was an entrepreneur, I even called them vulture capitalists, thinking that they wanted to take a huge percentage ownership in my business and that they would want to fire me and replace me with their MBA buddy from 20 years or they used to work with. And I don't think any VC wants to do that. They want to bet on the jockey where it goes back to management, management, market, technology. And if, if you don't get along with a VC, then you should not take their money. If you have a choice, like if, if, you're, if you're being courted by many, you know, go with the VC that you like. The other misconception is that like in French and German, they literally call the asset class capital risk and risk capital. So they're calling it, this is the risky stuff. Like this is going into the Monaco casino and spinning the, the roulette wheel. That's a misconception. I think buying Enron stock was one of the riskier things I ever did. You know, investing in the S&P, there's so many things you have no control over anything. What does QE mean? What does inflation mean? you know, Goldman Sachs screwing their own customers. Like it's so easy to, unless you're Gordon Gecko and you're breaking the law, how are you beating the stock market if it's not illegal, you know? Whereas in venture capital, we diversify and we know when, like we know what the sales are of Daily Harvest and we're not allowed to say it. So we're able to make an investment decision. Do I want to put more money in or not? That's legal insider trading on something that's already diversified. And there is a market out there. We're not alone to be the only VC to invest. So you have to earn your way into every deal. But so the misconception is that the VC is gonna screw the entrepreneur. That's not true. Some do, and there's, we could write novels of the war stories, but that's not, that's not what they set out to do. They're hoping that this will work. The second one is, I think it's lower risk than 
the S&P 500, the FTSE, stock market, crypto, all of that. I think it's a safe asset class. Yeah, I've always found it a bit interesting understanding the dynamics between a VC and a PE, what the difference is between the two. Well, it used to be very easy to spot them. You used to go to like yeah. a networking party and the PE guys are wearing ties and we were wearing blazers with jeans in an open collar. Right. <laughs> that, okay. that was that, That's how you could tell the VC from the, the PE guy. Now they're probably all dressing the same. But um, yeah, PE guys want to typically take a controlling stake. And so they, they have, you know, there's a change of control when they come in and they're often chain, like they buy Tele Denmark, they sell the yellow pages, but not until they lever it up to 95% of revenue on that utility, lever up the broadband, sell the call centers. They're making radical changes and they get out in like a year or they buy boots and they merge it with Walgreens and make a ton and get out. If they make a 2X and KKR has a 3 billion pound fund, getting 20% you know, of that is pretty good for your plans for Italy and the South of France mm. for the summer. Um, but but you know, it, it's very, very, very different. For us, we wanna understand the vision and see if we can support them and let them achieve that growth vision. And Andrew, thank you so much. I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed having you here. Lots of fascinating, interesting takeaways there. Guys, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And we'll see you at the next video. Speak soon. Okay, Kay, thank you so much. Bye for now. Take care. Bye-bye.